not only have no value, but they've awakened the indignation of God. So it's more than just it's not received. It's made God angry. They become the cause of divine indignation. All right, now listen, listen, this is God talking. I hate, as I say, some of you would prefer a more softer term. This is God talking to his people. I hate. Other versions say loathe. Some versions say detest. The Message Bible says, I can't stand your religious meetings. <laughs> pretty, pretty potent, isn't it? Pretty potent. The majority of the versions do say hate. I hate. Now, there's a, there's a little help that... Hebrew lexicons can give you on this. Because when you look it up, they say, now this means he hates. That's what the majority of them say. That's what they say. This means he hates. Well, I'd like to have a little more information on it than that. It, the word hate has a root word that means enemy or foe. So what he's saying is what's done is not the point, it's who did it. That's the point he's going to make. I don't hate this, these feasts because like I didn't say to do them because he did tell them to do them. I hate these feasts because of the ones who are doing them. That's why I hate them. Yes. As you're talking, that he was bringing an offering to the Lord, but it was his heart. His, he wasn't doing it with a full heart. Didn't have faith, did he? Yeah, that's right. You can see this, can't you? This is a revolutionary thought. If you've not seen it before. So the hatred of God is not stirred up by the act itself in this text here, but by the ones who did it. There's a lot of things God hates. He hates, for instance, idolatrous images. Deuteronomy 16:22. David may know that God hates the wicked and the soul that loves violence. Elsewhere, God says, I hate robbery for burnt offerings. Isaiah said God hated Israel's new moons and appointed feasts. God ordained new moons and appointed feasts, but when Israel did it, he hated it. Zechariah said he hates evil imaginations. Jeremiah says he hates abominable things. Malachi said God hates putting away. That's divorce. The glorified Christ said he hated the doctrines or teachings of the Nicolaitans. You see, there's a lot in Scripture about what God hates. The English word hate means intense hostility. That's a key word. That's the same sort of thing that it means under the old, in the Scriptures, hostility or enmity. In other words, this kind of worship that they were indulging in turned God into their enemy. God became their enemy. In fact, he categorically said that to the prophets, that he became their enemy. Now, if God's for us, who can be against us? But if God's against us, who can be for us? You mean to tell me that observing an ordained religious feast, something God told you to do, and you did it when he told you to do it, and you did it the way he told you to do it, that God had become your enemy because you did it? Yes, that's what our text is. It's exactly what our text is saying. He has an extreme dislike for what was doing, what was being done because of who was doing it. See, you take, for instance, the woman of the spirit of divination in Acts 16, she's 
following along after Paul and company saying, these be the servants of the most high God which show unto us the way of salvation. Well, let's see, that was that was technically the truth. But the wrong person was saying it. It's possible for one person to say, God so loved the world and God loves it. And another person can say identically the same words and God hates it. Because of who said it. That's the way God is now. <coughs> In our text, therefore, the word hate means that the action to which God refers has made him hostile and an enemy toward Israel. <coughs> he had an extreme dislike for what they were doing, and they were doing on the surface what he told them to do. Then he has, I despise. I despise your feast days. I despise them. Other versions say, I reject them. Well, they are disgusting to me, basic Bible English. I utterly loathe them, Jewish Bible. I abhor them. This is God talking about Jewish feasts that were observed that he told the people to, to do. I abhor them. Yes. On this, um, the wording and terminology in this, he says, I hate, and then there's a comma, and then I despise. I think that that is a way of saying I hate, and yet even more than that, I despise. Is that right in saying that? Yeah, this is. I think it's like a layered hatred for it. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, it is. It is. Yes. This is a, this is why it's so offensive for country music singers to sing hymns. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. They use they use the gospel exactly singing to be right. a stepping stone into country music, and then they want to revisit and sing yeah. hymns, and it's like you or you, you, don't you, start. you have you are living for the world, and now you want to take up a hymn. A lot of yeah. these hymns were written by people that suffered, yeah. so yeah. they brought forth these great significant truths because yeah. in their hearts they were giving their hearts totally to the Lord and suffering and so the hymns are born out of their suffering and these people are living for the world yeah. and they're trying to take up the same words. Now Elvis Presley had a religious album and people used to just gloat over how he sang how great thou art. People acquainted with Elvis Presley didn't think this. See, I remember his heyday, and he came to um, Holiday Inn in Maryville, Indiana. <coughs> and we found that he had a practice at all of his concerts, that he would like have a lottery to all the young girls, which one could spend the night with him. He did this everywhere he went. Everybody knew he did it. I wouldn't listen to a hymn he sang. That's like these people here, see. Now, some of you think that's too radical. We ought to thank God that he sings any hymns. Well, tell it to the Israelites here. <coughs> We're dealing with the divine nature here, see. It says, I despise. That's his nature. This is nature. This isn't like just a flash of an, a, that anger erupts, illogically erupts. That's not what we're talking about here. Men may do this. This is not what God does, just the illogical eruption of anger. He gets angry over something. That's not what we're talking about. This is his nature. When someone whose heart is distant from God takes God's words into their mouth, it makes God sick. When someone living for the world pretends to participate, in some kind of gathering, God's ordained. God will not receive it. This is what this text is saying here now. We're just not spouting some opinion here. This is what God is saying. <clears throat> I, I uh, despise your feast days. This, he calls them their feast days, but God ordained them, but not like they kept them. There are a lot of these feast days. They feast. These were whole feast days were days of holy remembrances. I remember. Israel's entire life 
centered around God. I'm not opposed to vacations. I've had them myself, but Israel didn't have any. They didn't have a Branson to go to. They, they didn't. All of their life, they had a feast It was unto God. <laughs> it wasn't just a family picnic. That's not what their entire life centered in God. And now here's these feasts. There were a lot of them. I'll name a few of them for you. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of the Passover, Harvest, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles. See, these were feasts they observed to God. There were particular things that were remembered at this time. But he said, I despise, <laughs> I despise your feast days. I loathe them. Your solemn assemblies. Other versions say your sacred assemblies, your holy meetings, your joyous assemblies, your general assemblies, your times of worship, or solemn convocations or conferences and conventions, the message does, trying to put it in language of today. <laughs> a solemn assembly was an assembly that's convened for a special occasion to God. It might have been for confession, it might have been for praise or thanksgiving, but it was a special, unscheduled gathering of the people of God for some activities towards God. <coughs> there were to be holy remembrances and sometimes special offerings were offered during each time there's solemn feasts. During the days of Nehemiah and Joel, solemn feasts were called and repentance and confession were, were expressed. They called for solemn assemblies to make up for lost for lost ground. See, numbed, Israel was numbed, spiritually numbed by a preface for self rather than God. They continued to observe these feasts according to the law, check the calendars to make sure they had the right, right time, check the duration of the feast, make sure they had it for the proper duration. <coughs> they continued to observe them according to the law but because of their personal depraved condition, God could not stand their feasts. He hated and despised them. They were an unholy people, and he couldn't tolerate what they did, even in his name. Now, you, you got to think about our times with this in mind. If the modern church is as unholy as it appears, then their gatherings, all of them, are likewise hated and despised by God. See, it's a resting thought. It's a, even, even if it's on the surface, you don't agree with it. Even if you say, that's a bit too harsh, you have to admit it is a challenging statement. You've got to have to wrap your mind around it and think about this, what God is saying. I mean, if my heart's not right, my worship's not accepted, yes, that's, it. that's exactly what we mean. The activity does not transform the person. Yes. And in this, he's speaking uh, to uh, a body of people as one person. That's right. Just like yeah. he speaks to the body of Christ as one, one person. person. That's right. So this body, wherever they're at, of people that meet like this, whether they be in an assembly of people <coughs> who are who are not meeting like that, or wherever they are, they're in this category. That's right. And the opposite of this is true, too. If there's a body of people who are wholehearted and single-hearted toward the Lord, then what they do is accepted. Amen. Yes, Brother Paul. This phrasing of, I will not smell it. Yeah, it's, I will not smell that's it. Not, it's not one of those, <coughs> I'll plug my nose and I'll go over and I'll look in and just be like, oh, it's so bad, but I'm, I'm there, but I'm plugging my nose. Yeah. So I can't, I can't see the smell. It's one of those, plugs his nose, he's not, he's not even, even close by. That's right. You're going by Terre Haute, Indiana, you can smell Terre Haute <coughs> you miles under, before you get there. <laughs> you remember under the law how they had that fragrant incense? That was so God could smell. That's what that was. Now Christ, his offering was a sweet-smelling savor. In other words, the Lord could come into the range of Christ's offering and take it fully in and it was pleasing. 
But with Israel, they couldn't do this. See, the people of God, when they pray, they'll lift up holy hands. That's First Timothy 2.8. That's serious. This is to be done. And for a long time, you didn't hear much about lifting up hands in certain religious circles, but now it's more prominent practice, and it's, it's not a bad practice at all, as long as the hands are holy. Amen. Lifting up holy hands. And Paul said, now men ought to know how to behave themselves in the house of God. Well, you're in an assembly of saints. you got to know how to behave yourself. Not before one another, before God, what he's talking about. <clears throat> when we come together, God says, no divisions. Let there be no divisions among you. See, we got different views. Let there be no divisions. Scrap your view. And adopt God's view. If you can't do that, just back off from whatever you're talking about. Don't participate in it. Let there be no divisions among you. As 1 Corinthians 11, 18. Let everything be done decently and in order and under edification. As 1 Corinthians 14, 26. An environment of entertainment or carnal joy. Yeah, it may be acceptable to people, but it's not to God and it never was. Many religious gatherings do nothing but stir up God's hatred and may cause him to despise it. Yes. This is so offensive because it's an attempt to join what is holy with what is unholy. That's right. And, and That's as right. soon as what is unholy touches what is holy, yeah. the whole thing is defiled. Unholy. That's right. Amen. Strong language, isn't it? This is, see, the, most of the prophets weren't able to say much more than this. They would give a prophecy sometime about what God was going to do when they were assessing the people many times. This. It seemed almost like most of the time, this is the kind of ministry they had. And you take the new birth out of the picture and take transformation out of the picture and regeneration out of the picture, and this is the way we'd have to talk, too. That's the same way we'd have to talk. Go right ahead. And as Paul referred to, let there be no divisions among them, but instead be like-minded. Like-minded. I'm inclined to think this is for the this is for the uh, for the working of the Spirit among you. That's right. You're exactly right. I'm, I'm thinking that if this is not if this is not uh, effective among the brethren, then I I just don't think this the Spirit is going to be uh, it is gonna work. forward. Right. You're right. So in other words, it's it's just not. Be not, let there be no divisions among you. It isn't just fulfilling that requirement isn't the point. The point is where the divisions are, Jesus isn't because he's not divided. God's not going to work in that environment. How would he work in that environment? What would he do? He'd have to scatter the people. That's, that's what he'd have to do. <laughs> like he did at Babel. Positive work. He may do a work, but it's not positive. Not positive not, work. Not, not a, beneficial for this. Not thing. beneficial. He may make some folks sick or yes. some folks die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As I hate, I despise your gatherings. I just, I don't think God enjoyed having to say this, but this had to be said because this is, we're dealing with God here. Now God continues, though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I'll not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. So God's speaking now again of activities that he ordained. Do you suppose it's possible that there are some baptisms that God despises? Huh? <coughs> some praise services that he hates? Well, yes, wherever there's people whose hearts are defiled and they engage in those kind of activities, he, he hates the activity because of them. Burn offerings. The law, from Exodus to Deuteronomy, contains 122 references to burnt offerings. They were a key offering. These were offerings with a whole offering was consumed by fire 
And it was like the offering went up to heaven in a smoke. That's, that's the kind of offering we're talking about. Burn offerings. It said that a whole burn offering, Deuteronomy 33.10, that's the offering we're talking about. The whole animal is burned up. <coughs> your burn offerings, he taught, your burnt offerings. Now, speaking typically, or from a standpoint of shadows, the burnt offering foreshadowed the offering of Jesus himself. His whole, his whole person was offered up to God. <coughs> it also depicts the believer offering his life to the Lord. See? A living sacrifice. It also depicts that burnt offering. Then he mentions meat offerings. You read meat in Scripture, there's a generic use of it. Sometimes it means food. Labor not for the meat that perishes, but for the meat that endures into life everlasting. That's food. But in the, under the law, meat offering was a non-bloody offering, generally of grain. No animal was killed. Sometimes it's called a grain offering by the New King James. The Revised Standard calls it a cereal offering. I mean they took this, the wheat seed and ground it up and made, processed it. A meal offering, f gifts of food, oblations, gifts, presents, thank offerings, sacrifice offerings. These are various translations of the word. But these were offerings that didn't involve the taking of a life. The offering of something that was processed from natural products. Leviticus 2.1 describes one meat offering as fine flour with oil and frankincense put on it. So that was a, in the raw, kind of an offering to God. There was also the meat offering that was baked. Leviticus 2.3-9. This offering is burned to the Lord and it emitted a sort of a fragrance uh, to God. As to a type that they represent, the burn offering foreshadowed the Lord Jesus offering his life or pouring out his soul uh, unto death. For a sweet smelling savor to God. The meat or meal offering foreshadowed the offering of our works or productivity to God. We take what we do, what we do. You offer your life to God. You offer what you do, the good works that you've been ordained to walk in. You offer them to God. Just as one offered a meat offering to the Lord, took what God had given him, prepared it, and offered it back to God. So we take the graces and the th truth, the things that God has given us, we, we produce something with it and offer it. Beautiful picture <laughs> to God. We are ourselves a savor of unto God, a sweet savor to God. Second Corinthians two fifteen. Now as for Israel's burnt offerings, meat offerings, God says, "I will not accept them." See, because G Israel had departed from God walking in their own ways, they immerse themselves in idolatry and immorality and injustice. Their burnt offerings and meat offerings were rejected by God. I will tell you right up front that I, I feel very, very strongly about this. Whatever I do unto God or for God, I do want it to be accepted. Amen. The thought of it not being accepted frightens me. I don't want God to say, I won't, I'm not going to receive that given. I'm not going to receive that you just offered to me. It's got a flesh taint on it. It's got a worldly order, odor to it. I'm, I'm going to reject it. I won't accept it. 
I'll not accept them. So forever purge from your mind the notion that if you do what's right, God will always accept it. They did what was right. They made the meat offering, meal offering just like God said to make it. God said, I'm not going to accept it. See, so you can do what's right outwardly, what's, what's right, and yet it's rejected by God. Yes, Judah. I think of the time where Jesus said, your lips, your lips say that you are of me, but your hearts are far. Far from me, that's your, right. Your hearts are far from you. I thought that anything you do because you feel like you just have to. <coughs> you feel like you have to, so you get it over with, just to get it over with, yeah. so you don't have it looming over you. We, we do have to do it, and we do feel the need, the obligation to do it, but we mean it when we do it. We put our hearts into it because we know that if we do it right, then God will accept, and that's the desire behind what we do. That's why God accepts it. That's right. You know, it is startling to think that when Jesus comes, now he picks the same point up. That's right. The people of his day. That's right. Mr. Barb. More than not being rejected, it's counted as sin. The scriptures say whatever is not of faith is sin. It's sin. That's right. That's yes, right. That's true. <laughs> From the legal point of view, Israel could say we're doing what, what is right. Maybe you, maybe, see, there's a certain denomination that has stated there are five acts of worship. And it's preaching and praying and singing and giving an offering and taking the Lord's Supper. And if those five acts are done, God has been worshiped. This is their official doctrine. Now, this is their doctrine. They teach this dogmatically. <coughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. You may worship God from the belly of a fish down at the bottom of the sea. And a lot of things missing there. But it's accepted. Or you may be surrounded with all the paraphernalia of Supposed worship and it's rejected. <coughs> Here's the fact that people overlook when they, they try and fulfill the letter of the law. They, here's something that they overlook that is how it's done is critical with God. How it's done. Not, what on, not only what is done, but how it's done. For instance, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. These are words which I command you this day shall be in thine heart. All right, so that's that's got to characterize any activity toward God. Here again it is stated, <coughs> This day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments. Thou shalt therefore keep them and do them with all thy heart and all thy soul. All right, so that's a factor. And Samuel said to the people, serve the Lord with all your heart. So if that all the heart isn't in there, it negates what's done. And rather, those words were before God cleansed the heart. That's right. That we may serve the living God. That's right. Now, how much more how much is more? the heart involved? That's right. Mm -hmm. See, there are people, this, this is taught so widely, I'm... I'm alarmed by it, but I don't see people, they just seem to swallow it. Is if you can just if you can just get to the church house and join in the praise service, it'll make up for everything else. It'll just it'll it'll compensate for everything else. Because God's love and He loves He just can't can't but come down from heaven and inhabit your praises. This is just the way he is. This is taught now. Taught dogmatically. And here Amos is, he's contradicting that whole line of thinking. And some, I understand, someone will say, well, that's under the Old Testament, that's Amos. But that's, no, oh, that's God. Yeah. Amos isn't representing a covenant, he's representing God. And God doesn't change. As Brother Gene said, now that there's been much more given, 
This is much more serious and much more focused. I heard just the other evening the wife of a very prominent media preacher the other evening make this statement. This is a quote. God shows up wherever there's praise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's a teaching. That's a quote. That's Exact a, words. That's a teaching. It is. Now they haven't read Amos. <coughs> yes. This is this kind of thing is why Jesus said to the Pharisees, the prostitutes and tax collectors are entering the kingdom of head of you. That's right. It's not it's not that it's not that prostitution or cheating people out of their money was acceptable to God, but those those people had a they they were repenting. That's right. And coming to Jesus, and yeah. the Pharisees weren't. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. there's. This is a this is a, a warning to all religious people here because there's something about religion that that actually makes a person they, a, a religious person doesn't think they have to repent. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. So uh, so the the reason why Israel was in this state is because they they thought they were okay. Yeah. Amen. And and this is serious because as long as a person's in that state, they can't be saved. How can you be saved in that state if if you don't if you don't if you're if you're unacceptable with God and you don't know it or you won't you won't even like it, admit it? Mm -hmm. How can a person like that be saved? They can. You're right. Now Israel didn't know it, and so God sent the prophets to tell them. So you can't depend on people just no, deriving this knowledge. They read their read their devotions every day, and pretty soon it dawns on them. That's not the way it works. Someone that knows the truth has got to let this be made known. And we know, we know God does forgive sin. Oh, yes. And there were, there were godly people in Scripture that did sin, but God forgave them. Yeah. Because, that, like David, he repented. Like Manasseh. Yeah. yeah. After 52 years yeah. of despotic living, yeah. Neither will I regard the peace offerings. Peace offerings are mentioned 84 times in Moses and the prophets. These were offerings con that consisted of animals. Sometimes they were animal sacrifices. Sometimes they were meat meal sacrifices. They were offered as thanksgiving, generally. They were generally considered to have been formal expressions of thanksgiving. The people had not been offering their offerings to the Lord with all their hearts as God had required. They were doing what we call perfunctorily. They were just going through the routine, the traditional 10 to 12. That'd be today that'd be a lengthy service though so today. 10 to 12. They go through it, make sure all of the points are in there. Start to make sure there's an offering in there and some prayers and maybe a sermon. And that somehow make up for for what we are. But it won't but it won't make up for what a person is. The people the, the people are basically hypocritical people. So the thank offerings weren't received by God. Jesus put it this way, This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts far from me, but in vain they worship me. See, it's just a, it's, it's a pointless exercise. It just heaped condemnation on them. It didn't help them at all. It didn't make God look favorably toward them at all. See, once this, once this registers on a person's soul, like it transforms their thinking, I'll tell you. It's possible for the best of us to not live a very good life for a period of maybe hours or days. When you come into the assembly, nothing you do will make up for that. You're going to have to take that up with the Lord and confess it and get your conscience cleansed Amen. so you can't do something to undo iniquity or forgetfulness or haphazard spiritual living. You, there's nothing you can do to make up for that. 
But Israel thought you could. And a lot of people today think they can too. I think of the natural world would be uh, that of necrosis or decay or, or an abscess where in the case of death or something is rotting, you, you need to bury it and there needs, there, there needs to be light and in the case of an abscess, uh, that has a very pungent, strong odor. That thing needs to be cleaned out. If you just go into a room where that is pervasive, yeah. and take, you could take a very expensive perfume, and you spritz that in the air, not only is it not going to touch the yeah. odor or the problem, it's going to defile the, the thing that's supposed to bring pleasure, bring yeah. enjoyment. Um, and, and people kind of treat religious activities like a sort of perfume they can just spritz all over yeah. death or inner, inner spiritual yeah. abscess. It doesn't clean it out. It doesn't actually bring life. And the things which God commanded, <clears throat> see, that, that's for the living. That's for yeah. health and vitality. You, this type of thinking, Satan will tempt you with this type of thinking. You'll have a something. You'll say, well, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna study now for a while." And that see, whenever there's something unacceptable in your life, you have got to deal with that. You've got to come take it before the Lord, confess it, and then He'll cleanse it. You can't get rid of it any other way. You can't do it. He, yeah, I think I'll go out and bless someone. I'll give to the, I'll. Give a big offering this to the Lord's Day. I'll give a big offering. They don't, they don't have to do it. It won't do it. It has to be dealt with directly. Yes? A lot of times when people try to do that, they'll even realize themselves that they come short in trying to do. <laughs> that's right. That's right. They can't do it. Their conscience will condemn them. That's right. That's right. You're, you're absolutely right. Another given. We yes. Ex we experienced this very thing in Florida. There was a man at Christmas time that, that had brought gifts um, to the church that we were ministering at at the time that filled the entryway of the church as gift bags for children. We didn't know this man or anything, um, but we invited him to stay for our service, and he did not. And I could tell within him that his conscience had, had pricked him. Yeah. And that what he was trying to accomplish by doing a good work actually compounded the state that he was That's in. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. <laughs> now, <coughs> finally, in <coughs> verse 23, the Lord says, Take away from me the noise. Take away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. <laughs> Do you like your praise to be known as noise? Noise is not like a... I know the scripture says make a joyful noise. That's not what he's talking about here. Noise is something that's a, is a clatter, a, a lot of disruptive activity. <coughs> Through Amos, the Lord expresses the issue of the vanity of Israel's religion. See, he's, he's bringing his point home. You're really religious. You're doing a lot of stuff, and you may have impressed the Philistines, but <laughs> it hadn't impressed me at all. God can be soothed by the music as King Saul was. Don't think God can be soothed by the music as Saul was. See, an evil spirit troubled Saul, and so David played, and that soothed Saul. Don't think that God, it'll soothe God, though. God's not like, God's not like this. When God reveals something about himself, he must have our attention. If God says, I hate, oh, oh boy, I got I, I to gotta know what this, I don't want to miss whatever this is, he's going to say. Or when God says, I seek out my sheep, oh, what, I want to perk up when I hear that. Or to this man will I look. I want to, I don't want to be dull, see, that. 
I will sever. Made his, his people from the Egyptians. He's going to perk up. Whenever God says something, he's going to do. You want to listen, whatever it is. I will help thee. I will shake heaven and earth. This is part of becoming acquainted with God. Job said, acquaint now thyself with the Lord and be at peace. Acquaint. Well, are you acquainted with the Lord? You have to ask yourself this question. Or do is it that I like a school kid knows their ABCs? I know some things about God, but are you acquainted with him? Could you recognize him if he came? Or if his influence is here, would you know it? See, that's, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. Now God reveals the effect of Israel's religion on him. <laughs> he says, it's a lot of noise down there. Take away the noise. Some versions say the tumult. The Son of God showed up in Jerusalem. And they didn't know it. They didn't know him. They right. were offended at what he said. That's right. And they schemed to put him to death. Yes. Yeah. Some versions say they take away the tumult. Or the sound, your noisy songs, the din of your chanting, noisy hymns of praise. You notice that uh, the more music is toward the world, the louder it gets. You notice that? Huh? You don't hear, you won't hear a worldly people have meditative, you know, they, it's noisy. So evidently Israel is really, they probably had praise bands, you know. They really went all out. And I, 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 it's just a bunch of noise, a bunch of racket going on down there. Isaiah said God was weary to bear their gatherings. It wears, <laughs> who wears me out, exasperates me to be there. Noise. Isaiah said God was weary to hear. And through Ezekiel, God said, I will cause the noise of your songs to cease. <laughs> now Amos says, he says, your noisy songs, <laughs> take them away. Get, get them out of my presence. I don't want to hear them. Now, I, I must admit that a lot of modern Christian so-called music aggravates me. I understand I, I don't want to purposely be against everything, but my soul is agitated by a lot of these songs, both by what they say and the way they're sung. That's how God was here. I'll not hear your instruments. The instruments, they have big instrumentalists. The instrumentalists. The melody of your stringed instruments, the King James Version says. The sound of your harps. My ears are shut to the melody of your instruments. I don't want to hear the strumming of your lutes. Let me not hear the melody of your psalteries, and I'll not listen to your music no matter how lovely it is, the Living Bible says. Why? Because it wasn't expert music? or No, it's because of who was playing it. That was the point he's making here. You can see that, can't you? That's the point he's making is who was doing it, not what they're doing. It's who's doing it. The taint was upon it. When singing with instrumental musics, there were times when it was heard by God. <coughs> <coughs> Instrumental music played by a person who's godly drove an evil spirit away from King Saul. So if it's instrumental music, one day there's some instrumental music Satan can't stand. Ha, ha, how about that? Ha, there's some instrumental music Satan can't stand. That's the kind you want to play. Let's play a lot of that kind of music. And one time when Elisha got ready to prophesy, he called for a minstrel, and as the minstrel played, the Holy Spirit, come on, whoa, we want that kind of music. We want that kind of instrumental music. Yeah. Kind of instrumental music, the Holy Spirit comes and teaches people what to say. Oh, evermore, give us that kind of, kind of music. And one time at the dedication of the temple, it is written, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. Boy, that must have been something, huh? Trumpeters. It wasn't just one or two of them. We're talking hundreds of people. Trumpeters and singers were made were as one. 
to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking God. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and I guess you could hear the singers back in those days, and praised the Lord, saying, He is God, for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. God, glory, that's how God felt about that kind of music. Trumpeters, singers, singing loud, joining in, blending their, the voices, blending with the trumpets and praise to God. God came down. Glory of God came down. Why? An acceptable spirit was in the people. That's why the people were in, really involved in this. Now, in the day of Amos, this isn't what was happening. Instead of the glory of God coming down, God said, my hatred's risen up. I'm indignant. I'm hostile. I'm not going to listen to anything that goes on down there. I'm turning it off. God can turn it off. See, we talk about men turning God off, but God can turn men off. He could just turn it off so he doesn't pay any attention to him at all. Let me cry. Let me cry. Let me feel very sorrowful like Judas. So I'm going to go hang myself. And God say, go ahead. Not touching me any. No repentance. See, no repentance. Their hearts were darkened, Israel. And so it, it voided everything they did unto God. So God reacts to this manner because what a person is cannot be divorced from what he does. Amen. It's true of God, true of Jesus, true of mankind. What, it, what we are cannot be divorced from what we do. And God views what we do in view of what we are. And if we aren't one with him, what we do is just unacceptable. Now, God reacts in the same manner because what a person is, because what a person is can't be divorced from what he does. He makes you new, see? He recreates you so what you do will be accepted. That's the rationale behind it. He transforms you so he can receive what you do. Because you want to do the right thing, your heart will be in it. When this takes place as a divine objective, here's, it's stated this way in Romans 6.13. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So you, what you are, sanctifies what you do. It is again, Romans 6, 19, As ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and, in, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members as servants to righteousness and holiness. Take what God has made you in Christ Jesus and offer that to God. Make your body serve that part of you has been begotten of God. And when you do, God will receive what you do. See, it's a glorious truth. That's the kind truth. of God is looking for. That's from right. what he has said and from what he has done, then that's an increase. That's an increase. He's Amen. brought it about, but we're participating in Amen. it. Amen. We're involved in it. And it's something that will continue as long as you're alive in the world. It's, this will continue to it. Grow and expand. God will give you something. You will convert it into life, and then offer it to God. That's that's how it, that's, that's how it goes. Yes. Sir. I pressed again with this point of whatever we have going back to God. You said that um, whatever we have, we're supposed to use and multiply and expound and then give it back. <coughs> but if we withhold anything from him, then it's not something to be proud of yeah. at all. Yeah. He gave you an ability. You can expound that and make it better, multiply it, 
But then if you don't give it back to him, if you don't give the credit to him, because it wasn't you, it wasn't you of yourself that gave you yourself the ability to do it. It was God who gave you the ability the ability and the ability to multiply what he gave you. Yeah. So we have to give it back to him and give him the credit because it wasn't of our own doing. Yeah. Not of works that man should boast. Yes, Lord. What you're saying here is exactly what Jesus was dealing with with that woman of, in, of Samaria. That's right. Remember, the, the idea of worship came up, and he That's just right. he cut right to the quick here. Go get thy husband, and then come back. See, yeah. that, this had to be dealt with. And then he said, God is a spirit, yeah. and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So luckily, salvation came to that woman's house, but... Hey, we don't we don't need to be talking about worship right now. We need to be talking about what this that's conflict right. that's taking place in your See, life. See, those that are in Christ do worship. Amen. The only time anyone is told to worship after Jesus died is in in Revelation. It said, "Worship God, all ye you know." That's the only time. No church is ever told to worship God. They were told they do. We have the circumcision which worship God. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yes, Anna. Um, God only expects those who accepts those who have faith because they are righteous by their faith. That's right. Amen. Well said. Mm -hmm. Really? I was considering when um, when we were talking about this um, noise that um, the people of Israel made um, as to God, it was just noise. I was thinking of like a young child about maybe two or three will take out pots and pans and uh, maybe some wooden spoons and they'll start banging on it. And they think they're making music, but they're not. It, after about 10 or 15 minutes, actually gets kind of loud and kind of annoying. Yeah, annoying. And so, um, see the importance of being faithful to God, as you said, um, and that if when we're faithful to God, then He will um, accept <coughs> our praise. And our praise will actually be music to him. It won't be loud banging. Yes. Jason. Yeah, in light of this passage, it seems that there's probably a lot of religion. It's not done to God, so who's it done for? Well, it's done for other people. It's people performing for other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a very dangerous yeah. aspect of being religious. That's right. In any sense... Mm -hmm. At any time, any one of us can be tempted to do or say things not for the glory of God, yeah. but so that other people mm -hmm. will hear us and praise us and mm -hmm. accept us Amen. and like us. Amen. This is something we all have to, you have to be aware of this. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, sister. Roxanne. I was actually thinking on the same terms as Brother Jason. I just thought of it in a slightly different way. Um, when we do, when we worship and when we give to, well, we're supposed to give to God, but when we do these things, we're supposed to give to God. So the question is, if their heart is not in it for God, who are they actually giving it to? Are they giving it to themselves as like a, a, a way to kind of give a false peace within themselves or a way to kind of blend in with a crowd or is it a way to gain either profit or money or fame or fortune which then that kind of made me think of people using God's name as like a cloak or kind of like a wolf wearing sheep's clothing yes, yeah. where they're the only reason why they're wearing the sheep's clothing is so their prey or whatever they want is coming closer to them so that way they can yeah. trust them and another image that kind of came to me is what would a shepherd do if they saw a wolf covered in sheep's clothes I would imagine that they would be like David and they would immediately go out and either kill them or mm. scare them off mm -hmm. and I imagine that's what God would do when these people in wolves of sheep's clothing when they worship God without their heart in it they just cast off you know i don't want you near my flock That's i don't right. want you near my reward my trust my feed my protection i don't want you near me at all so that was in my head <laughs> yeah so it's uh, something to yeah. think about i'll tell you that these are right these are good observations Is it? 
not taking the name of the Lord thy in God vain. in vain. And, and more than not pleasing men, it's not pleasing God. I mean, uh, we're talking about this, and, and we're talking about, you know, they may have been, they were doing these these feasts, they were doing these things, and they may have been doing these things thinking that made them acceptable, but it did not make them acceptable. No. So the only way you can be acceptable is through Christ. That's correct. Mm -hmm. I, I did want to point out that they'd been doing this for hundreds of years. So it wasn't that they didn't have time to evaluate. That's what, that's, that's the co divine commentary on unregenerate people at their best state are in a state of decline, in the best state. That's why people have to be born again. Yeah. All right, we'll close there. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of regeneration, for the marvelous benefit of justification, so we can get out of this dreadful category of vain worship. We want, Heavenly Father, to please thee in all we do. We know that your grace is thoroughly sufficient that the Savior can finish this faith that he's authored. And so we pray for the strength to maintain a godly focus and center our lives in Christ and refuse to be moved. In Jesus' name, amen.